Hello, everyone. Well, today I'd like to introduce you to a new idea that me and my colleagues have been working on for the past 10 years. Uh, we call it quantum cognition. And I know it probably sounds like a, you know, kind of a stranger, uh, unusual idea to you, but I hope by the time that I'm finished, I'll convince you that it's a pretty interesting new area of research. So let me share my screen with you and we'll get started on this. Okay, so quantum models of cognition and decision. <clears throat> so why do, you, why do we wanna use quantum theory to begin with? Well, quantum theory turns out to be a, a general axiomatic theory of probability. It's just as equally general as the uh, traditional probability theory that we work with. Sometimes we call it classical or Kamigura probability. In fact, some people argue that quantum probability is even more general. It's like a generalization of classical probability. Now we know from behavior research that human judgments and decisions, they tend to be probabilistic. <clears throat> now, you know, not only do they tend to be probabilistic, but these probabilities, uh, they, they seem not to obey the um, Kolmogorov axioms that are the foundation of classical probability. Now, quantum probability, probability theory is a generalization in, a, in, in ways. And so it might provide a viable alternative, <clears throat> but you might think well, that's kind of a shot in the dark. Why, why pick a quantum model? In fact, there's other, other probability, generalized probability theories we could pick besides quantum. Probably quantum is the closest one to the classical Kolmogorov, but you know, why, why pick quantum? <clears throat> and one of the main reasons is that quantum probability was developed in physics because the, the measurements that they had to work with in physics were non-commutative. You know, if you measured a particle, you change the particle, and then that changed the next measurement. And so this non-commutativity was an important part in physics. Well, that's also true in, in psychology. When you measure a person, you change the person. So this change produced by measurement produces these context effects that are, are that produce this non-commutativity. In fact, um, Niels Bohr, he invent well, he he used the idea of complementarity in physics, the idea that, you know. We can't measure something simultaneously, but both measurements are required to understand the phenomena completely. And um, you know, some of these ideas of complementarity were actually inspired by the earlier psychologist William James. And so we're trying to bring complementarity that back to psychology. So this non-commutativity and complementarity, those principles are common in both physics and in psychology. And another reason is that <clears throat> When we work with quantum probability theory, it puts probability theory into a vector space. And uh, cognitive scientists like to work with vector spaces. They like to think of, um, they like to put their, their ideas, their concepts, concepts and, uh, and, and decisions that we make can be represented in some kind of a vector space. Like connectionist neural network models, they, 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 write, they use um, vector spaces basically to represent the dynamics of uh, thought processes. So that's the third reason. So, well, how do we use quantum theory? Uh, you know, people get, are sometimes scared because when they study quantum physics, they, they encounter a lot of partial difference equations and it seems like a really complicated topic. But however, you know, quantum probability theory is actually very simple. And, and it's probably easy to see how simple it is if you take a look at quantum computing. In quantum computing, they work with a really simple um, linear algebra and, um, and finite dimensional spaces. And so, the, and so the theory is actually, the essential theory is actually very simple. And, and we're gonna be working with these, these simpler finite dimensional spaces in our work. So how do we use quantum theory? So the, so the best way to um, maybe to learn about how we use quantum theory and cognition and decision is to compare it to, um, maybe a theory that you already know, which is the classical probability theory, the Kamigorov theory. So quantum theory is based upon some axioms and Kamigorov theory is based upon some axioms. So let's compare these two axioms and see how they differ. So we're gonna be looking at, um, here's a picture of Kamigorov. He, uh, he axiomatized uh, class, what we call classical probability theory in 1932. And of course, classical probability theory was around for a long time. 
maybe 1700, but generally or in Laplace and Lagrange and those people. But it was finally axiomatized by Kamagora from 1932. And of course, quantum probability theory was originally invented by, you know, the quantum physicists like, you know, Bohr and Heisenberg and Dirac and Born and, and Schrodinger and those people. But it wasn't really axiomatized until 1932 by von Neumann. And so we're going to compare these two axioms, set of axioms. So first of all, if we take a look at um, classical probability theory, the way cl classical probability theory works, it, it works with sets, the idea of sets. So they start with this, what they would call a sample space. A sample space is the universal set. It contains everything can happen, you know? So if, I, if I'm, you know, asking, uh, somebody, uh, their preference on a rating scale and the rating scale maybe can go from, you know, one to seven, like one means I dislike it very much, seven means I like it very much. You know, those, those, those seven points on the rating scale, those are seven outcomes that we could observe in a simple kind of experiment where a person gives a rating from one to seven. So that's each, each point on that rating scale is an outcome and those seven points together form a sample space. So that's at the set of all, all the outcomes. Now, the way quantum theory works is it, instead of using a, a set, like a sample space is a set, universal set, quantum theory uses a vector space. And so, you know, and each outcome in a quantum model is a orthonormal vector, a signal like an axis, a different axis that, that span, that um, in each, in the, the collection of all these axes span the, the vector space. So, for example, if we have a a preference scale is a seven point rating scale, we would have a seven, we could use a seven dimensional space. And each axis, each of those seven dimensions could represent one of the axioms, I mean, one of the um, outcomes, like the outcome three would be a, you know, like a, what we call a ray or an axis in that seven dimensional space. So we're replacing um, a set, a sample space with a vector space and each outcome in the classical model is a point in this, in that set, but each outcome in quantum theory is an orthonormal vector, like in one of the axes in the vector space. And so in classical theory, an event, like, you know, the person gives you a rating, you know, greater than, greater than four on the, um, on the preference scale, you know, like a five or six or a seven. So they're fairly strong preference. Well, that's an event. So that event is a subset of the sample space. So you know the, the the event giving a rating greater greater than four would can would be a subset that contains three points, you know five six and seven. So that's a subset. So the so the idea of classical probability theory is that is we have these events and these events are described as subsets. And so when when you adopt subsets as the kind of mathematical representation of an event, you're buying into a logic, and the logic that you're buying into is the logic of subsets, which is the same thing as Boolean logic. Boolean logic has axioms like, you know, um, you know, associativity and um, distributivity and commutativity. These are all strong axioms of Boolean algebra. And so maybe those axioms are too strong. Now, the way quantum theory works is an event is a subspace. So, you know, we have things in a vector space. And so the event like getting a, giving a rating greater than four that would be a subspace and it would be spanned by three vectors, the five, the, the, the rays representing five, the ray representing six, and the ray representing seven. So three different axes out of the seven would form the subspace for the event um, giving a rating greater, greater than four. And so in quantum theory, what, you're, what we're doing is we're, we're representing events as subspaces. And so when we, event, we, when we represent events as subspaces, we're buying into a logic, a new kind of logic. It's called, the, it's the logic of subspaces. And it's no longer the same as the logic of subsets. The logic of subspaces is no longer Boolean. For example, commutativity doesn't necessarily hold. You can have an event A, like in, in classical probability theory with subsets. If you have an event A and you have an event, another event B, well, you always have a, a, the conjunction event A and B and A and B is the same as B and A because they're represented by intersection. But in quantum theory, you can have an event A, which is a subspace, and you can have another event B, which is a subspace, but there is no A and B because there's no subspace that represents the conjunction of those two events. And so 
And, and, and instead we have to represent the, a sequence of events that are non-commutative like A and then B or B and then A. So commutativity breaks down in quantum theory where commutativity is assumed by the classical theory. And, and another thing is like distributivity. In classical theory, A and B or not B, like A parentheses, I mean, A and parentheses B or not B is the same thing as A and B union A or not, A and not B. A and B union A and not B. But that doesn't work necessarily in quantum theory. So you can have an event A, but it doesn't break down to A and B union A and not B. And so distributivity can break down. So, so in a sense, in that sense, like quantum theory relaxes some of the axioms of classical theory. Classical theory uses these events as subsets and it imposes a strong set of Boolean axioms. Whereas quantum theory, um, <clears throat> sometimes these axioms can hold, but sometimes they can break down. So quantum theory allows for these axioms to be possible, but allows for them to also be, uh, possibly break down. So it's a little, in, this, in that sense, it's a more general theory. It's a little bit more flexible. The axioms are a little bit more general by using subspaces. Now, in classical probability theory, when we want to assign a probability to an event, let's say, what's the probability that somebody's going to give a rating greater than four? Well, we have to, we have to construct what we call a probability function, P, P. P is a function that assigns a probability to all these events. And so that's how classical probability, and of course, this probability function is, is a number greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So it ranges between zero and one. And another thing about this probability function is when we have two events that are mutually exclusive, like let's say A versus, let's say B is mutually exclusive, of, mutually exclusive of A, then the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. And so that's the probability function that's used in classical probability theory. Now in quantum theory, um, it works a little bit differently. We have a state but the state is now a vector. It's a unit length vector in, in the vector space. So we got this vector space, let's say this with this rating scale, it's a seven dimensional space. So the state would be a, a, a unit length vector sitting in that vector space, you know, a vector sitting out there. <clears throat> that vector represents your beliefs or your preferences. And the way we calculate the probability of an event, like, you know, that you give a rating greater than or equal to four, <clears throat> as we take that vector, sitting in that vector space, let's say it's a, a seven by one vector, and we, and we project it onto the subspace. Now, P sub A would be a matrix that represents the, the subspace. So every subspace has a corresponding projector, which is a matrix. So S would be a seven by one vector representing your state, and P sub A would be a projector that projects this vector onto the subspace representing the event, like giving a rating greater than or equal to four. So in other words, P sub A would be projecting this vector onto the subspace spanned by like five, six, or seven. So we get this, the product of this, and when we multiply this, you know, seven by seven matrix projector times a seven by one vector A, we get a projection. And this projection will be, projection will be a seven by one vector. And if we take the squared length of that projection, that gives us our probability. So the probability of A is, is obtained by taking our state projecting onto the subspace and getting the squared length. And so in a way, this is like what we're, what we're doing is this vector is like represents your preferences and this projector represents the subspace and the, this product tells you how well your preferences match that subspace. And the greater the match, the, the greater this projection is. Now, another thing you might think this is a strange kind of calculation, but if you ever, many of you in social sciences have done linear regression and this is exactly what we do in linear regression when we're computing R squared. Like let's say we do an ex a study <clears throat> and we have um, 100 subjects in a study. Well, then we'd have a 100 by one vector space. And we might have two predictors, X1 and X2, that we're trying to use to predict, you know, let's say a subject's attitude. And so this, these two predictors are gonna span a plane. So we have a plane, which is a subspace, this plane sitting in the 100, 100 dimensional space. And so we have our subjects and what the regression model does is it, it makes a prediction by <clears throat> projecting the scores from the subjects onto the plane and those are the predictions. And then the R squared is a squared length, well, proportional to the squared length 
of that projection. And so when you're computing R squared, you're, you're doing exactly this calculation. So you, if you've done regression, you've actually done this calculation when you've calculated R squares. So quantum theory is like using R squares to compute probability. <clears throat> Now let's go one step further here. So, you know, an important part like of any kind of Bayesian inference process is um, to update your opinion after you, you know, observe some new information. And so here we're looking at like the probability now of event B, given that we've just learned that event A occurred. So what's the probability of B conditioned on A? So we have to form a new probability function given this new fact. And so the way classical probability works to construct this new probability function is they take the original probability function and we get the joint probability of B and A and we normalize by the probability of A. And that gives us our new probability function of B given that we've learned A occurred. And so this denominator is a normalizing factor so that the events on B across all the possible values for B sum up to um, one again. Now quantum theory looks kind of very similar. So here's our calculation for probability event B, given that we observe that event A occurred. So we'd st we start with our state vector again, and then we project on the subspace for A, event A, and then we project on the subspace, that, take that projection and project it on the subspace for event B. So we're getting a sequence of two projections. And then we get the squared length of those two projections. And then we normalize it by the probability of event A, and that gives us our conditional probability. So this numerator here is the joint probability in classical theory, and it's commutative. So the probability of B and A is the same as the probability of A and B because intersection is commutative. But in quantum theory, these projections don't have to be commutative. They, be, they could be commutative or they could be non-commutative. Here I've got shown as non-commutative, but they could also be commutative. But if they're non-commutative, that's when quantum probability departs from classical probability theory. If, if the events were all commutative, then quantum theory would be re reduced exactly to classical probability theory. So in a sense, quantum probability theory generalizes classical probability theory by introducing these non-commutative projectors, which represent you know, subspaces that, 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 don't, that don't, there's no con, you know, intersection that forms a, you know, like there's no A and B intersection of the two subspaces that forms a subspace. So there's no A and B event. There's only an A and A and then B. So in this case, on the right-hand side, we have the probability of B and then A in that order. But on the left-hand side, we have the probability of A and then B. So, so like uh, the event that comes first is project, we project on that first. And the event that comes second, we project on that second. And so that's how we compute the, um, the joint probability in quantum, well, it's not a joint probability, it's a sequential probability. And here's their conditional probability. So that's, those are the essential differences between these theories. And you know, basic, using these basic axioms, we can derive a lot of really complicated things. And in fact, you know, the, the complicated com quantum physics, once we add some dynamics to it, that gets, it gives you all the partial difference equations that you study when you study quantum physics. So let's take a look at you know, how these, these ideas are applied in psychology. So how do you use this quantum theory in psychology? So let's take a look at um, order effects. I mean, you know, the whole idea of quantum probability is that you know, it's, it's non-commutative. So that's an essential idea of quantum probability. <clears throat> so we better be able to explain something about order effects in psychology. Now, order effects are really common phenomena like in surveys. If you ask questions in different orders, you often get different answers. And so let's, <clears throat> we wanted to ex investigate to what extent you know, we can account for these kinds of order effects. So we have a paper published in PNAS on applying quantum theory to order effects. <clears throat> so here's an example. Get this thing out of the way. Now this is a real study. This is a real, these are real results from a Gallup poll done maybe in the 19, <clears throat> 80s or something, I forget the exact date. But these are, this is the real Gallup poll results. And so, you know, they, in this Gallup poll study, they were investigating, <clears throat> you know, attitudes like hostility between white and black people. So we can ask, 
you know, questions like, do you, do you think blacks dislike whites or do you think what, whites dislike blacks? But we can do that in different orders. So here first is a black white order. So in this order, participants were asked, first they were asked, do you think blacks dislike whites, yes or no? And then after they answer that question, they're asked, do you think whites dislike blacks, yes or no? So that's a very simple thing. But we ask these two questions in, in this order, the black white order. And there's 500 people that got it in that order. Then another 500 people got it in the white black order. So we just simply ask, do you think whites dislike blacks, yes or no? And then after they answer that, do you think blacks dislike whites? Now we think of this problem as kind of like a perspective changing problem because you know, in the black white order, when you first ask about blacks, you know, you have to think about things from blacks, a black person's perspective. But then the second part B, you got to change your perspective and put yourself in the white person's shoes and think about it from the white person's perspective. And so this kind of question is a kind of changing perspectives. You got to put yourself in the different, you know, person's point of view. Now here are the, re here are the real results. Oops, go back here. So <clears throat> this is the results for the white black order. And so in this cell here, this is like the proportion of people that said yes to the white and then said yes to the black. And this is the proportion said, that said no to the white and then yes to the black. So that's 0.16. So that's the white black order and so on. Now here we have, you know, this table is the black white order. So here we have, this is the proportion of people that said yes to the white and then, I'm sorry, but this is the black white order. So this is the, this is the proportion of people said yes to the black and then yes to the white. And then this is the proportion of people that said yes to the white. This is, sorry, you're getting tongue tied here. So if we look at this, the black white order here. And so let's go back again. This cell right here is the proportion of people that said yes to the black question and then yes to the white question. And then this proportion right here is the proportion of people that said yes to the black question and then they said no to the white question because the black comes first. And so you see there's a big shift right here. In the white black question, you know, saying no to white and then yes to black is 0.16. But in the black white order, he's saying yes to black and no to white is 0.0597. So there's a big order effect here. And that difference between these two orders is called the, what we call the context effect. That's the context effect of order. So, you know, this bottom table is taking each cell in the top two tables and taking the difference. If we take the difference between the two cells in the top table, we get the, the context effects in the bottom cell. So 0.16, you know, minus 0.0597 gives you the 0.1015 and so on with all these cells. So that's context effects. And so we can do a statistical test to see if that, you know, of course these are, these are sample results. And so these are sample proportions and they could, they could be differing, you know, maybe by chance, but we can do a statistical test. And this is a large sample size, by the way. So it's a pretty powerful test. Anyway, we get a, a significant difference, a significant context effects. So we can reject the hypothesis that um, these results are just due to chance. And the probability of getting a chi-square this large or larger is like one out of a thousand if, the, if there's just due to chance. So we reject the idea that it's due to chance. So that's, that's an order effect. That's a question order effect. Now, how does quantum theory apply to this kind of result? So here's a quantum model. Now we call this a toy model because it's overly simple. But it, you know, we want to start out simple to illustrate the ideas. <clears throat> so remember in quantum theory, when we, when we, you know, when we work with them, um, events in quantum theory, we put them in a vector space. <clears throat> so here we have a really simple vector space. It's two dimensional, you know? And so this first, we think that we can think of this as a ray or an axis. This first ray or axis represents saying yes, saying yes, that whites dislike blacks. So this is the event representing saying yes, whites dislike blacks. And then this axis right here is the axis um, saying no to this question. You know, when you're asked, do, do whites dislike blacks? You say no, 
So that's the uh, do whites dislike blacks question. <clears throat> and here's the real result from the, uh, from the uh, Gallup poll was actually 0.4. <clears throat> so now the way quantum theory works is here's your state vector. So this represents your kind of your beliefs that it, that's used to answer questions. So we're here, we're being asked the questions, do whites dislike blacks? So you start with this belief and, then, and when you try to answer the, the question, do whites dislike blacks? Well, what's the probability that you say yes? The probability that you say yes is we take your state vector, which is a unit length vector right here. And we project it on, on the ray that the, you know, that representing the event, yes. So we take your state vector and project, project it on the ray representing yes. And so this line right from, from zero to where this vertical line hits, that's the projection. And that, that projection happens to be 0.63. If we square that projection, we get 0.4. And so that's how quantum theory works, is that simple. We take our state, we project it onto the answer and get the square projection. Like the probability no would be taking the state and project it onto the, onto the um, no dislike, no, no answer. And that would give us like point, a probability 0.6 when we're finished. Now, what about, you know, <clears throat> the, you know, that's the white. So this is the white dislikes blacks question. Now we got, you know, that's, so that's looking at um, the perspective from the white people. Do white, you know, do whites dislike blacks? But now we got to change perspectives. Now we've got to look at from the perspective of the, of the black people, do blacks dislike whites? So now we're changing perspectives. And the way we represent that in quantum theory is again, we got a vector space but when you work with a vector space, <clears throat> you know, we can change the basis. Like here, this is, this green is the green basis, is the basis that we use for spanning the vector space for the whites dislike blacks question. But we can rotate that basis, you know, do a rotation, orthogonal rotation to change the axes. And so we use a new axis, we rotate to a new axis to represent the question, do blacks dislike whites? And so, this this axis, <clears throat> this axis right here, which has got this negatively orientated line, is the, represents the answer yes, blacks dislike whites. And orthogonal to that here, this one, this increasing line here, red line, is the answer no. So this represents the answer yes, and then this answer represents the answer no. And so we've ro rotated away. The green represents the whites dislike blacks question, that's the white perspective. But the red represents the blacks dislike whites, that's the black perspective that we use. We still have the same state as before. And so this state S is the same vector we had right here. But now it's used to answer the black dislike white question. So when we answer that question, we take our state, we project it on to the you know, subspace, this, this ray, this axis that represents yes. And so the probability that you say, yes, blacks dislike whites is this projection right here from the zero to this, this, this line right here. And that projection is 0.37. If we square that projection, we get 0.14. And so the answer comes out to be 0.14. <clears throat> and so that's how we compute the probability for the black. So we use one axis representing the perspective of the white, and we use a different axis, the red axis, for the perspective of the blacks. And we have the same state but we're projecting on different subspaces representing blacks and whites. Okay, so that's fine. That's looking at each question separately, but what if we put them together to look at order effects? <clears throat> so let's look at this left panel here. This shows us how order effects works. Now, so in this case, we're gonna be <clears throat> looking at what's the probability say yes to the white black question, and then yes to the black white question. So to get this projection, we have to first project, project on the yes to the white black answer. So that we first are looking at the projection on this ver horizontal line right here. So we start with this state and we first project onto the yes to the white black question. And then we have to switch to the black white. And so that now we're gonna be projecting on this negatively related line, which is the um, yes to the black white question. So we first project on the yes to the white black, and then we continue down and project on to the yes to the black white. And so this is our pr product of projections, this 0.76 right here from zero to this 
line right here. If we square that, we get 0.36. So the probability that you say yes to white, black, and then yes to black, white is 0.36. But if we go the other way, if we first look at the black, white question, and then the white, black question, well, we have to first project on the black, white, yes answer. So here's the, you know, the subspace, the ray, we call it, you know, the axis representing yes to the black, white question. So we first project down there. And then we have to project onto the white, yes to the white black, which is this horizontal green line. So we project down here and then we project up here. And then that's our pro product of projections. And that product is 0.35. And if we square that, we get 0.12. And so we see that we get you know, an order effect here. Probably saying yes to white black and then yes to black white is 0.36. But the probability saying yes to black, yes to black white and then yes to white black is 0.12. Anyway, so when we change the orders, we're getting a big change in the order, in the order and the probability. So that's that's how we that's how quantum theory explains these order effects by doing this rotation for different perspectives. Now, that's a toy model. What's the general model? So here's our general model. So this says, well, whenever we ask a question and we're looking at the probably say, let's say yes to question A and then no to question B, what we do is we imagine you have some state and some, you know, could be high dimensional space. We don't necessarily work with two dimensional spaces. It could be a very high dimensional space, like 100 or 1000 dimensional space. Concepts are really complicated. We might need to put them in a high dimensional space. So this is a vector sitting in a high dimensional space. Now we're saying yes to A first. So first we project onto the subspace for A, and then we're saying no to B second. And then we take that and we project on the no to B subspace. So we get the product of these two projections and that squared length gives us the probability of saying yes to A and then no to B. And then if we say, and if we're asked the opposite order, the probability that you say no to B and then yes to A, we just reverse the projectors. That's the simplest possible model you can imagine. And that's how quantum theory works. So that's how, how it works in general. And so, you know, that's, that's the very general model. Like, and, but what can we do with this general model? Well, what we did is we derived a very general prediction from this model, but an exact prediction, which is really very rare for the social sciences. It's an exact quantitative a priori prediction generated from this general model. We call it the QQ equality. So here's our QQ. So this is what the quant our quantum model, this thing must predict. And it must predict it for any state vector. And it must predict it for any pair of projectors. Now we're assuming that there's no information in between. So we're, we're assuming that you ask one question followed immediately by the other. And then we get this, this result. And so this is, an, this is an empirical statement. So this, these are all empirical probabilities that we can observe. And so this QQ equality says that if, if this theory is true, then this Q value must be zero. Now what this Q value says is like, if we take a look at saying yes to A and then no to B, plus the probably saying no to A and then yes to B when in the AB order, you know, that's gonna turn out the balance out so that the difference comes out to zero for saying yes to B and then no to A plus no to B and then yes to A when, when we ask in the B then A order. So these two terms have to back, cross out to be equal to zero. In fact, if we go back to our um, context effects, what, that, what we're saying is this cell of the context effects plus this cell of the context effects has to can cancel out to zero. So these, these off diagonals have to sum up to zero. That's what this prediction is. It's a very unusual prediction. And you know, does it, is it true? I mean, this was pretty scary when we derived this because you know, this is the general model and, and it doesn't have any parameters. If this prediction fails, this, this model, this general model fails and, and so we're in trouble. But it turns out this, this, this prediction works pretty well. So let's take a look. Now, first of all, this, this table, this, this figure here shows, well, some results on order effects. This is, this is, so this is not the QQ equality here. This is looking at order effects, how prevalent order effects are. And, and uh, my colleague uh, collected 72 uh, national surveys by the Pew Foundation over 10 years on political judgments like, are you happy with the president? Do you think the country's doing well? Things like that. And so these are 72 national surveys. Each one's got about a thousand participants. 
and you can ask the questions in, in two different orders. And so we can look at order effects. And so this is, this is a Q, what we call QQ plot, plot, showing you the order effects across these 72 Pew surveys. Now, this horizontal axis represents the, the, um, you know, the size of the order effect if it was just due to chance. And then this horizontal axis represents the observed order effect. Now, if the observed order effect was just due to chance, then all these circles would be on this line. Now, all these circles are way above this line showing that the observed order effects are much larger than you'd expect by chance. And so we're getting a, you know, a lot of deviations, large deviations, uh, which represent real order effects, which are statistically significant. So we're getting statistically significant order effects in the data sets. But even though we're getting these order effects, can we still satisfy the QQ equality? And so here we got the same 72 surveys, but now we have the predicted chi-square if the, if the QQ equality is correct, true. And here we have the observed chi-square produced by the observed data. And you can see all these points are aligning right up on the line, suggesting any deviation from the QQ equality is just due to chance. So in other words, the deviations from the QQ quality are just, just you know, sample noise, but the deviations from due to order effects are statistically significant. And so this is really strong support across these 72 national surveys for this QQ equality. This is a really powerful test of our theory. I mean, it's an a priori prediction and it's a general prediction and it was pretty well substantiated. And so we're, we're pretty happy with this prediction. It's, it's kind of rare in social sciences to get such a strong prediction. Well, let's take a look at another result. This is the um, called the conjunction disjunction fallacy in probability judgment errors. So this is this is a result concerning how do how people do probabilistic reasoning, reasoning under uncertainty. <clears throat> now this result was first discovered by Kahneman, Tversky and Kahneman in 1983. They published these results in 1983 in Psychological Review. Now Danny Kahneman. Well, for these kind of results, not just this result, but many other results, won a Nobel Prize in um, economics for this, this work on um, you know, how, how people's judgments and decisions kind of deviate from maybe what we think of as rational models. Now, Amos Tversky, he probably would have gotten, probably would have gotten the Nobel Prize with, along with Danny Kahneman, but he died earlier and you can't get the Nobel Prize when you're dead. But anyway, they both did this work and it's been, um, had a high impact. I mean, these, there's thousands of studies right now on the conjunction, disjunction, probability judgment errors. Now, this is a, just a reference of ours where we published a, a quantum probability theory to explain these findings. But let's first take a look at this conjunction, disjunction, probability error. What is the result? So here's an example. Now, this is just one example. There's hundreds of other examples. So you just don't, don't get focused, focused too much on just this one example. But here's the example. So, you know, they had, Tversky and Kahneman asked their students, these are students from Stanford, by the way, in the 1970s, I think, or early 80s. <clears throat> so you're told this story. Linda was a philosophy major as a student at UC Berkeley, and she was an activist in social welfare, social welfare movements. So that's information that you're given. Now, everybody also knows that UC Berkeley is kind of a liberal college and philosophy major is kind of a you know, liberal person, <clears throat> probably. Not always, but, um, and she's active, active in the social welfare movement. So that's, that's information. So that information is gonna give you some what we call prior, like in the Bayesian model, prior beliefs, but in the quantum model, your prior state vector, that unit length vector is gonna be based upon this story. And then you're asked to rate the following events. Okay, so here are the different kind of questions they asked the, the students at this point. Well, what's the, you know, like, you know, let's suppose she's graduated. And this is like after she graduated. What's the probability that Lynn is a feminist? Well, this, you know, given this story, it makes kind of sense that she could be a feminist. Feminism is a really big deal, and it still is a big deal, but it's really a hot topic in those days. Anyway, it seemed very likely that she'd be a feminist. And so, <clears throat> you know, they gave her a rating of 0.83, pretty, pretty high probability. And there's nothing wrong with that probability. You can say you can't say it's rational or irrational. And so that, but it makes sense. No, you can also ask, is Linda now a bank teller? <clears throat> well, it doesn't seem like it. She's a philosophy major in Berkeley. Doesn't seem like she'd end up like a bank teller. And so you give that a low probability, let's say 
that's reasonable. <clears throat> There's nothing irrational about that. And so that's the average, these are average judgments from a real experiment. But then you're asked, well, is Linda a feminist and a bank teller? Now they give that average probability 0.36. Now here's where we run into a judgment error. Well, 0.36, that we call that the conjunction fallacy because the conjunction that she's a feminist and a bank teller is rated higher than her just being a bank teller. So this kind of doesn't make sense for classical probability theory because you know, bank teller contains feminist and bank teller and bank teller also contains other things like not feminist and bank teller. So bank teller should contain more. You know, this set here should be bigger than these two, the conjunction of these two. So this, this conjunction should be an intersection that's contained in this set. But that's, so that's called the conjunction fallacy. Pretty dramatic violation of Kolmogorov type of theory. But not only that, if you take a look at the disjunction, is Linda a feminist or a bank teller? They rate that as 0.6. Now 0.6 is below feminist alone, it's 0.83. So they rate feminist alone as 0.83. Here they're rating feminist or bank teller as 0.6, lower. Now <clears throat> feminist alone is contained in feminist or bank teller, because you know feminist or bank teller contains feminists, but feminist or bank teller contains people who are not feminist. And so that's another fallacy. That's called the disjunction fallacy. So we get conjunction fallacies and disjunction fallacies. And so this violates classical probability theory. It, it, it you know, comes from the distributive axiom and the distributive axiom leads to the law of total probability. This is the law of total probability in, quantum, in the classical Kolmogorov theory. So this is the probability bank teller. Well, bank teller can happen two ways, being a feminist and a bank teller or being not feminist and a bank teller. So the probability that you're a bank teller, so you know, bank teller is feminist and a bank teller or not feminist and a bank teller. That's the distributive axiom. So the probability of bank teller is the probability that you're feminist times the probability that you're a bank teller given you're a feminist, that's the joint probability, plus the probability that you're not a feminist times the probability you're a bank teller given you're not a feminist. That's that's the um, joint probability for that. So these two joint probabilities add up to give you bank teller. Well, the joint probability of feminist and bank teller is right here. That's the joint probability of feminist and bank teller, but bank teller's got both of these terms. <clears throat> so bank teller's got this term, which shares that one, which is the same as that one. But bank teller's also got this term, which has to be greater than or equal to zero. And so this bank teller has to be greater than feminist and bank teller. And so this conjunction fallacy violates this law of total probability. How does a quantum model do this? So here we have the quantum model. <clears throat> so this line right here connected with this S, this line right here represents our state vector, our problem. <clears throat> that's, that's our beliefs based upon the Linda story. Now this blue horizontal line represents our axis for evaluating the, well, the blue lines represent the, the basis that we use for, represent, for evaluating feminism. And so this horizontal line represents the, the subspace, the ray, you know, the axis for yes to feminism. And its vertical line represents the subspace or the ray for saying no to feminism. Now, the bank teller question we imagine requires thinking of things from a different point of view instead of thinking about, you know, feminist at, you know, attitudes, women's attitudes, we're thinking about occupations. And so we have to rotate to the occupation, occupation kind of point of view. And so this, this, uh, this red line with the positive slope here represents our subspace you know, axis for saying yes, that she's a bank teller. And this, this negatively orientated line is the axis or the subspace for saying, no, she's not a bank teller. So we're changing, so what we're assuming here is that Feminism questions uses the blue axis and the bank teller questions use the red axis and they're rotated with respect to each other. So we have to change our perspective from the feminism kind of way of thinking, you know, like the fem attitude, feminist attitude type way of thinking to the occupation type of thinking that's changing that kind of perspective. So here's our state vector. And we use the same state vector for both answering both questions. <clears throat> 
But if we want to know, well, what's the probability that she's a, that yes to bank teller alone? It's just that simple question alone. The probability that she's a bank teller, we take our state vector and we project it on this ray for bank teller. And so when we take our state vector, we project it on the ray for bank teller, it's got a low probability. It's only 0.16. The square projection here is just 0.16. It makes sense given the story. But if we look at the question, is she a feminist and then a bank teller, feminist and then a bank teller, we first have to project on the feminist, yes, the feminist axis, and then we project on to the yes, the bank teller. And so when we make this sequence of projections, the sequence of projections gives us a larger projection. The square projection comes out of the 0.3. And so the feminist and then bank teller probability turns out to be larger than the bank teller alone. And so that's how we produce this conjunction fallacy in this model. So this is a toy example right here. This, this configuration also gives you the disjunction fallacy. So we can use the same configuration to produce the disjunction and the conjunction fallacy. Now that's a toy model, but what does the real model look like? Looks like this. So this looks like a little bit mathy, but it's actually kind of simple to go through. So bear with me here. So here's our basic principle. You know, we hear the Linda story, so we've got the state vector. And then we have some projector that represents bank teller. So the probability of bank tellers, we take our stack vector, we project it on the bank teller, we get the squared length. And now the event bank teller, that's a matrix. So we multiply this matrix times this vector, but we could stick an identity matrix in between. So the identity matrix acts like the number one, doesn't change anything. So the bank teller times identity matrix is just the probability bank teller again. But this identity matrix can broke, be broken down then into two parts. It can be broken down to one subspace that represents the feminism and then your orthogonal complement that represents not feminism. So these two subspaces sum up together to form an identity matrix. Now, but now we can multiply through here and we get, we get this product, we get this sum of two products. And this is what we call superposition state. So, you know, in this superposition state, we're superposed between Linda being a feminist or not a feminist. We're not asked about feminism, so we didn't make up our mind about feminism, so we're superposed on feminism. And so when we're asking, the, asking about this bank teller question, we remain superposed about the feminism question. And so to get the probability of the bank teller question, we have to square the sum. Now, when you square a sum, you're gonna get this first term squared, that's this term, and then you're gonna get the second term squared, that's this term, but then you're gonna get the cross product, this term times that term, plus this term times that term. That's what we call this interference right here. So when you square a sum, you get the first term squared plus the second term squared plus the interference. Now this first term here is the, is the joint probability of feminist and then bank teller. And the second term here is the, you know, um, let's call it sequential. The sequential probability of feminist and then bank teller. The second term here is a sequential probability of not feminist and then bank teller. Now, if this interference was zero, then we'd obey the law of total probability. But if the interference is non-zero, then we're gonna find violations of the total probability. So the quantum theory can violate the law of total probability by this interference. Now, this interference will be non-zero whenever these projectors, whenever these projectors don't commute. If they don't commute, see right here, you can't move these things. If they commuted, you could take this probability of not bank, probability of not feminist, move it over next to probability feminist and they multiply it by each other to zero. But if they do not commute, you can't move that there. And so you get this interference effect when they don't commute. Now, if they don't commute, this interference effect can be negative. And it's, if it's sufficiently negative, then this whole term right here could become negative. And if this whole term here becomes negative, then the probability of bank teller will turn out to be less than the sequential probability of feminist and then bank teller. That's just like this toy example showed the probability of bank teller can turn out to be less than the sequential probability of feminist and then bank teller. But this is, the, this is the general mathematical argument. So this toy model is just a special case of this general model. Now using this general model, we can predict a lot of other effects. And uh, uh, some of these effects have been, have been confirmed. Now this order effect is one of the interesting effects. We, we predict that you should get order effects when you ask these kinds of questions. And there's some controversy about this. Some people don't find order effects and some people do find order effects. So that's kind of a controversial point, but we make this prediction, but 
anyway, that, that point's still a little bit uncertain, but some of these other predictions that we make have been satisfied. I'm not gonna go through all these predictions in detail because I wanna move on to another example. So let's take another example, uh, interference of categorization on decision-making. This is kind of a psychological version of a double slit experiment. <clears throat> so, so in this experiment, people are shown faces like this face right here. And, and, and we're gonna see like in some of the conditions, they're asked to categorize the face, like is this guy a good guy or a bad guy when we look at the face? And then you have to make a decision. Do they act friendly or, or, or aggressive? And, and there's two kinds of faces. Some of the faces are kind of narrow. And, 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 when, and when they're trained on this task, they're trained to learn that these narrow faces tend to be the bad guys. And then these wide faces, they tend to be the good guys, but it's probabilistic. You know, so sometimes the narrow, most of the time the narrow faces are bad guys, but sometimes they're good guys. And most of the time these wide faces are good guys, but sometimes they're narrow. So it's a little bit difficult because it's probabilistic, but that's what they're trained on. So the probability that a narrow face is bad is 0.6 and the probability that a wide face is good is 0.6. Now, if we tell you that the person is bad, you get a reward for you know, acting aggressive and attacking but you, a probability 0.7. But there is some probability that you get punished for it. But most likely, if they're bad, you should attack. Now, if, they're, if you're told they're a good guy, then most probability you get re rewarded for the withdrawing 0.7. But sometimes, occasionally, if you're told it's a good guy, you're punished for withdrawing. So it's probabilistic. But most of the time, if it's bad, you should attack. And most, most of the time, if the person's categorized as good, you with, should withdraw. So it's, a, it's what we call a probabilistic categorization and decision-making tests. The probabilities make it a little bit difficult and uncertain what to do. But we had two important conditions. And one condition was, this makes it like the two slit experiment. In one condition, we're asked, we're asked the person to first to categorize it, you see the face and then you categorize it, good or bad, and then you make a decision. And then you get feedback, whether it was you know, a good guy and, and whether you get rewarded or not. That's, that's the categorization decision-making condition. But we had another condition we call it the decision alone condition. In this condition, you see a face and you just make a decision. Now, of course, implicitly, you should be categorizing because the, the, you know, whether you get rewarded or not depends on the category, but we don't ask you about the category. So this, this category re remains implicit. Here it's made explicit, but here it remains implicit. So that's this decision without categorization. So we compare these two conditions. Now let's take a look at the law of total probability here. Now, according to the law of prob total probability, you know, the probability that you should attack, well, well, it depends on if it's a good guy or a bad guy. And so these are the two things, you know, can happen. So the probability of attack should depend on, well, what's the probability that you think it's a good guy? And then what's the probability that you attack given you think it's a good guy? That's the joint probability of saying good and attacking. And here's the probability you think he's a bad guy. And then there's the probability of attacking given you think it's a bad guy. So the total probability of attacking should be the sum of these two terms here. And so in our experiment then, we're measuring this left-hand side in the decision alone. <clears throat> we measure, you know, all by itself. That's the decision alone. What's the probability of attacking? So we can get this measurement here. And on the right-hand side, we can get the total probability. So, you know, this is the total probability when you ask to categorize first and then attack, summed across your, your categorizations. So we get to, you know, we get all these trials where you categorize as good in an attack. And then we get all these trials where you categorize as bad in an attack, which sum all those trials together to get the total probability. So what we're comparing is this kind of prediction from the total probability. We're trying to see whether or not the probability on the decision alone matches the prediction that you'd expect from the total probability right here. And so we're testing this prediction from the well, total probability. And so here are the results. Now here are the results for the good guy category. So that like you see a good guy and the probability that they say it's, they categorize it as good guys 0.84, which makes sense because it was a good, so you know, it's a good guy face, you know, it's a wide face. And the probability that they attack given good guys low 0.35. And then the probability they think it's bad guys 0.16 and that, you know, it's one minus 0.84. These two have to add, add one. And then they probably they attack given it's a bad guys 0.52 it's higher, higher than the 0.35. And then the total probability, if we multiply 0 0.84 times 0 0.35 plus 0 0.16 times 0 0.52, get the total probability is 
Now we compare that to the probability of attacking when we just, when we don't ask them to categorize. So all these came from trials where we ask them to categorize. And then this is from the trials where we don't ask them. And it works out pretty well for the, for the wide faces, the total probability works out pretty well. It's a little bit, a little bit off 2%, <clears throat> a little bit higher. But now look at the bad guy faces. You know, here's the probability that they think it's good. It's low 0.17 because it's, it's a bad guy face. And the probability they attack, given it's, they say it's good guys is low 0.41. Now the probability they say bad guy is 0.82. Well, th this is a little bit of rounding here right here. Anyway, this, I mean, this should be maybe it was 0.83 or somewhat one of these are rounded off. But this, this is one minus that one. And then this is the probability that you attack given saying it's bad guy. So it's high, higher than this one because you thought it was a bad guy. And then the total probability is 0.17 times 0.41 plus 0.82 times 0.63. It gives you 0.59. There's a little bit of rounding error in some of these numbers. But basically the total probability comes out to be 0.59. And then we compare that <coughs> to the probability of attacking alone. And it's 0.69. It's much higher. You know, the probability of attacking when you don't ask them to categorize is 10% higher than the probability of attacking when you ask them. It's like, you know, asking the, the categories before you, you shoot lowers the probability of shooting. If you don't ask them to categorize first, they go ahead and shoot too much. <laughs> well, actually this is the optimal decision for this task. Yeah, so anyway, another thing that's interesting is the probability that they attack when you don't ask them if it's good guy or bad guy, it's 0.69, it's higher than the probability of attack when they thought it was a bad guy. So that's strange. You know, the probability attacking when you, when you haven't, they didn't make up their mind is higher than the probability of attacking when they decide it's a bad guy. And so these are violations of the law of total probability here. So those are kind of dramatic. And again, we can account for these with our toy model. <clears throat> so here's our axis for representing um, the decision to attack or withdraw, the blue axis. And here's our axis representing our, our categorization, good or bad, good guy or bad guy. Now, if, if, if you've made up your mind that it's a bad guy, then you're in a state right here. And so the probability that you uh, attack is gonna be this probability right here. And so this is the probability that you would attack given that you thought it was a bad guy. Now, if you thought it was a good guy, you'd be in a state right here. And so the probability you attack given it's a good guy is right here, so it's lower. So here's the probability of attack when you think it's a bad guy. And here's the probability of attack when you think it's a good guy. But here's the state when you haven't made up your mind. You know, this is the superposition state. You're superposed between good guys and bad guys. You, didn't, you, weren't asked to, you were not asked to categorize. So you, you're not in this state or not in this state. You're in between the two superposed. So this is your state when you're not asked to categorize. That's the superposed state. And so the probability that you attack from the superposed state comes down right here. And it's larger than the probability that you attack when you think it's a bad guy and it's larger than the probability you attack when it's a good guy. So that accounts for this, this probability right here being greater than total probability and this probability here being even greater than this probability of attack given it's a bad guy. That's the toy model. Sorry about that. So here's the general model, but this looks just like the one we just talked about with the conjunction fallacy. So the probability that you attack when you're only asked about the decision, you're not asked to categorize first. We just take your state and, pro and project on the subspace representing probability to attack. But that subspace, we could stick, you know, this projector, this is a matrix, we can stick an identity in there. And then we break that identity down into two orthogonal complementary subspaces, the probability that it's a good guy and the probability it's a bad guy. And so when we multiply through, you're in a superposition state. You're like, you're not asked in this, in the, in the attack decision alone, you're not asked whether it's good guy or bad guy, so you're superposed between the two. And so we get the squared length of the superposition state, and we get the first one squared plus the second squared plus the interference. This, if the interference is zero, again, we have the total probability. It'd be the probably your good guy in the attack and the probably a bad guy in the attack. But if we have, if we, if these subspaces are non, if, you know, if these projectors are non-commutative, then we have this interference effect. So this interference effect causes violations of the total probability. So that's, that interference effect helps us, ex, how, is how we explain these, these results. Now in this, these studies, we actually built, built um, uh, these projectors from the payoffs of the experiment. And so we just didn't 
you know, plug down the interference, we actually try to derive the interference from the payoffs in the, in the experiment. So you'd have to look at the original papers to see how we derive these projectors to get this interference. So we first derive the projectors and then the projectors give us the interference. And then let's take a look at a, com a completely different result. Now this is another study involving Amos Tversky. She appears a, was a postdoc with him, 1992. And we published a paper to account for these results using quantum theory in 2009. So here's a game called the prisoner's dilemma game. <clears throat> in the prisoner's dilemma game, like um, you have two players, the player and the, and the opponent. And so the player can decide to, to a defect and the opponent can decide to a defect. And then the opponent would get 10 points and the player would get 10 points. You know, or here, the player can decide to cooperate and the opponent can decide the effect and the opponent would get 25 points and the player would get five points. And similarly for these, this diagram here, we'd have the player defect and the opponent cooperating and the player would get 25, the opponent would get only five. And here they both get 20. If they both cooperate, they both get 20. Now let's think about it. What should the player do? The player, the player can say in his mind, well, what if the opponent defects? If the opponent defects, I'm in this column. And so the player is gonna compare this 10 with this five. And he's gonna say, well, look, if the opponent defects, I'm better off defecting. I get 10 instead of five. But then the player might say, well, the, the opponent might cooperate. If the opponent cooperates, what should I do? Well, if the opponent cooperates, I can get either 25 or 20. And so, well, 25 is better than 20, so I should defect if the opponent cooperates. So I should defect no matter what the opponent does. And it turns out to be the same thing for the true, for the opponent, the opponent should defect whatever you do because it's got kind of this symmetry situation here. So in this prisoner's dilemma game, uh, you should defect even if you don't know what the opponent's gonna do. So we call this, um, actually this is an axiom of rational decision-making. If you prefer to defect when you know the opponent's gonna def defect, and you pre prefer to defect when you know the opponent's gonna cooperate, then you should prefer to defect even if you don't know what the opponent's gonna do, because it doesn't matter what the opponent's gonna do. So that's called the sure thing principle because you know, you should surely defect because it doesn't matter what the other player is going to do. Now, Tversky and Shafir and Tversky tested this using a clever experiment with three different conditions. Usually the prisoners dilemma game, they play simultaneously. Both players make a move without knowing the other player. So that's what we call the unknown condition. So, you know, the, the player has to make a move without knowing what the opponent's going to do. But they also added two new conditions. They had these players in two different rooms on computers. And so the, uh, the opponent can be known to cooperate, like the, the opponent's already made a move and is gonna cooperate, and that can be communicated to the player. So the player knows the opponent's gonna cooperate, or the opponent can defect, and then the player is told that, that the opponent's gonna defect. So we can look at the probability that the player will defect when the opponent's known to defect, and then we can look at the probability the player defects when the opponent's known to cooperate, and then we can look at the unknown condition. And we can compare these three conditions. Now, again, we're gonna look at the law of total probability here. Let's, what's the probability that the player should defect? Well, the probability that the player defects, well, he's gotta think about what the opponent's gonna do. So according to the total probability, um, the probability that the player defect, well, that's the probability that he thinks or she thinks that the opponent will defect times the probability that this player should defect given that she thinks the opponent will defect plus the probability that she thinks the opponent will cooperate times the probability that she should defect if she thinks the opponent will cooperate. So that's our total probability prediction. So the probability defecting should be, you know, this joint probability plus this joint probability. Now empirically we, we find, of course, this makes sense. And so this is the empirical result is that if we know the opponent's gonna defect, the player defects more often than if you know the opponent's gonna cooperate. So if the per opponent's gonna cooperate, the player will cooperate more than if the opponent's gonna defect. So we have this ordering, we know that this, conditional probability is greater than that conditional probability. In other words, we know this conditional probability right here is greater than that one. Now, the thing is this, this joint, this total probability is an average because this is a weight. So this is a weighted average. So the total probability is a weighted average of this one and this one, and this one's larger. So anyway, this weighted average from this total probability has got to be less than this single one right here because we're averaging in the lower probability right here. And so, well, the total probability predicts that the probability defect should be greater than, I mean, what this, what this total probability predicts is the, the total probability defect 
has to be between the probably defecting when you know the opponent's going to defect and the probably defecting when you know the opponent's going to cooperate because it's going it's the average. It has to be between these two. But the result shows something dramatically different. Here are the experimental results. These are Shafir and Tversky's original results. We later, my student Merv Matthew and I later replicated these results. So here, look at, we're looking at the, what's the probability that the player will defect. Now, if you know the opponent's going to defect, that the player defects 97% of the time in diversity study or 91% of the time in our study. And if the player is known, if the opponent's known to cooperate, the player still defects about 84% of the time in diversity study, about 84% of the time in our study. These are one shot games, by the way, not repeated play. So you only play the player once. You play the opponent once. So here we see that generally speaking, the player will defect if the opponent defects. And generally speaking, the player will defect if the opponent cooperates. But what we find around here, right here, is very often people switch and change their mind. If the, if the opponent's play is unknown, they defect only 63% of the time. They ch a lot of people are changing their mind and starting to cooperate. So there are, a lot of people are violating Savage's principle, sure thing principle, because they defect when they know defect, they defect when they know cooperate, but then they change their mind, switch over. Some of them, a lot of them, switch over and decide to cooperate here. Anyway, this violates the total probability because it's below these two. This number here is supposed to be in between the two. And so that's a violation of our total probability. It should fall, fall in between, whereas it's, it's way, way below. So that's another violation of total probability. Yeah, so that's our violation again. So these are another example of compelling results that there's something wrong with, you know, the way classical probability, Kalmogorov probability, you know, fits with human judgment and decision-making. Now these results, you can also be attained with a gambling game. So, you know, in the gambling game, people are given a, a chance to play a gamble. They had, an, they had a, a gamble where you had an equal chance to win X dollars or lose Y dollars. And they were given three conditions. This is again by Schwer and Tversky, this study. They were given three conditions. They were asked, they were told, well, suppose you want, you're, you're playing this game twice. And so you're supposed, you're, and you're, you have to play the first stage, but then you, you can make, you can decide whether you want to play the second stage. And so you're, you're given three conditions. And one, in one condition, you told you won the first game. So you just won this dollar, this X dollars. And then you're asked, now do you want to play again, knowing that you just won? Or in another condition, you're told you lost the first stage. So you just lost this amount. And so now you're asked, now that you lost, do you want to play again? Or they had a third condition where they didn't know. So the first stage was played, but they didn't know what happened. And now they have to decide whether they want to play the second stage without knowing whether they want to lost the first stage. So that's the, that's the experiment. And so what did they find? Now, first, let's take a look at the sure thing principle again. You know, according to the sure thing principle, if you prefer to play after a win, and if you also prefer to play again after a loss, you should prefer to play even if you don't know what the outcome of the first game is. So that's the sure thing principle. Or the total probability would say, the probability that you play when you don't know the, the outcome should be the probability that you think you're gonna win times the probability that you play given win plus the probability you think you're gonna lose times the probability that you play given lose. So the probability that you play in the unknown condition should be some average of these two, should, should fall in between these two. But what they found was, if they know they won the first game, 65% of the time they chose to play again if they won. What Tversky and Kahneman thought was, well, if they won, they thought, well, I got extra money to play with, so I'll play again. So that was the reason for playing again if they won. If they lost the first game, most of the time, but less, but most of the time they decided they want to play again. And Tversky and Shafir thought, argued that, well, maybe if they lost, they wanted to make up for the losses. So they wanted to play again to make up for the losses. So they got a reason here. They have extra money to play with. They got a reason here. They have to make up for the losses. But in the unknown condition, they drop down to 35%. That's below, way below. In fact, it's below 0.5. Here, most of the people prefer to play if they win. Most of the people prefer to play if they lost, but most of the people prefer not to play if they don't know, violating sure, like violating the sure thing principle. And, it, and it's also violating the total probability because it's, it's falling way outside these two. It's supposed to fall in between the two and it falls way outside. 
So that's another example of violation of total probability in gambling. <clears throat> yeah, so that's a pretty interesting result there. And again, I'm not gonna go through the algebra, but the same, the same model. So the beauty of quantum probability theory, we think, is it ties together all these very different results. It would basically use in the same model every single time. Now, again, in, in this context, we built projectors. We built a projector for, you know, playing, following a win, or, you know, we, we built projectors for um, playing the game, following a win, and playing the game, following a loss. And so we could derive the interference from the way we built these projectors. We, and we built these projectors using the payoffs in the game. And so we can, we, can, we can do a quantitative comparison now. We can compare our quantum model with a prospect theory model. Prospect theory was a popular model of decision-making invented by Kahneman Tversky in the 1980s. And um, they used that explanation. They originally used the, the prospect theory model to explain their findings you know, for this um, gambling task and for the prisoner dilemma game. But we had our, our new quantum model to explain it. So we can compare both of these models. Now both models had four parameters and we had, we had 100, we used the gambling task, the two-stage gambling task, and we had 100 participants and we had 33 different two-stage gambles per participant. And we could get a planned choice and a final choice for each person. And um, we did a base factor because some people argue maybe the quantum model's predicting better because it's more complicated. But Bayes Bayesian model comparisons are supposed to take in complexity, model complexity into account. So we did a Bayesian model comparison at the individual level to test the quantum model versus the prospect theory model. But they both had the same number of parameters, but we did a Bayesian model comparison. And what we found here, this is the log base factor. The log base factor across all these 100 participants strong, strongly favored the quantum model over the prospect theory model. So we are quite happy. This is a quantitative comparison of a traditional decision-making model with our quantum model. Well. I've gone on pretty long here. Actually, I have, we have other applications to, to tell you here, uh, like this is a kind of an interesting one of how interference affects a choice on confidence ratings. We published in, just in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, but I, I'm not gonna go through this one because we're, we're getting a little bit long on here. And we have a lot of additional applications like causal reading and similarity judgments and mirror measurement effects. So we'll just get jump to our conclusion. So anyway, what we're seeing here is that quantum theory provides an alternative framework for developing probabilistic and dynamic models of decision-making. And it provides a coherent account for puzzling violations of classical probability found in a, in a wide variety of judgment decision-making studies. You know, it links together all these different findings with this common set of principles. So we think it forms a, a new foundation for understanding widely different phenomena in decision-making using a common set of axiomatic principles. And if you're interested, if I got you interested, then you might be interested in reading our book, Quantum Models of Cognition and Decision, published by Peter Bruzo and myself in 2012 or 2011, I think. So that's all. For so thank you very much for your paying attention to me. And I'm going to stop here and uh, I'll, ask, I'll answer any questions. <laughs>